The problem that we have is this. You can never necessarily put yourself in the mind of an officer when he or she's making that split second decision. Historically, the trend has been not to prosecute. It's so hard to be able to do these types of prosecutions unless the facts are just so egregious on their face. You don't have a choice but to prosecute that cop. A man begs for his life, pleads with the police not to shoot him. As he's crawling toward the police as instructed, he's shot five times and dies from his injuries. It's becoming a more visible story in America, a questionable circumstance. The police open fire, a suspect ends up dead, and even though it's caught on video and the officer goes on trial, the verdict comes back, Second murder, not guilty. which raises the question, when aren't police officers allowed to use lethal force? And why is it that so few of them are convicted of a crime when they do? You have a movement by Daniel Shaver where he's taking his right arm and it looks as if he's reaching towards his waist while he's crawling. He was either going to reach for his waistband to pull it up because his pants were um, coming off as he was crawling on the ground or as um, Officer Brailsford testified during his trial, he believed that Shaver was reaching for perhaps a firearm um, and that is the reason why he shot and killed him. So was Officer Brailsford justified in shooting? There is something called a use of force continuum or a use of force matrix. Cops are taught how to deal with a situation that starts to escalate and the ultimate level of a use of force matrix is lethal or deadly force. There's a series of Supreme Court cases that establish the legal justification for a use of lethal force. For an officer to use lethal or deadly force against a subject, that officer has to reasonably fear that given the objective circumstances of that particular scenario, he or she is going to be looking at harm as a result of that subject. What you're asked to do is determine whether given the circumstances specific to that scenario, that cop acted reasonably based upon everything that was before him. And that's where things get tricky because what's reasonable isn't determined by a panel of former police officers or legal experts but rather by individual juries. There's no black and white um, bright line test that you can apply other than to say, did that officer act reasonably given the circumstances that he or she encountered with that subject? And again, that doesn't give you guidance. I mean, it really leaves it sometimes as a free for all for a jury to have to make a decision as to whether or not you did the right thing. And that variance makes it difficult for prosecutors to bring charges and win convictions against police officers. It's got to be a unanimous decision by the jury, and so you're asking each and one of those individual jurors to say, hmm, did that officer act reasonably given the circumstances? And you and I both have different interpretations of what's reasonable. We all do. And so you're trying to ask those jurors to come to one unified decision based upon their individual interpretations of what is reasonable. And that makes almost an impossible standard for the government or the state to be able to achieve or to be able to prove in order to get a guilty verdict in a police shooting. And that proved true in Officer Brailford's trial. At the end of the day, after two days of deliberations and less than six hours, that jury found that Officer Brailsford acted reasonably given the circumstances. Historically, the trend has been not to prosecute. But it's so hard to be able to do these types of prosecutions unless the facts are just so egregious on their face. You don't have a choice but to prosecute that cop. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.